Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a real honor and pleasure to be with you here this morning, and I thank the Swedish Council for all of their help in uh, getting me here. Um, I'm going to start with, this is kind of, if you're a fan of Monty Python's, this is like the summarizing Proust competition. I've got 15 minutes to sort of distill uh, 30 years worth of work. And as a Canadian, we're known to be polite. We say thank you to ATMs. So I'm a, this is my omnibus apology slide. So if I fail to mention something, if I uh, misstate something, for all of my uh, errors, I apologize at the beginning. But I'd also like to thank all of my colleagues at the University of Toronto and the World Health Organization, Public Health Agency, of Canada who've helped, and Jasper, who've helped uh, inform my thinking over the years. So in many ways, uh, we're facing something that our uh, species has faced since time immemorial. And early on in the pandemic, I was encouraging people to read the plague until it became clear that we were living the narrative. But two quotations strike me as particularly uh, perceptive. One is, everybody knows that pestilences have a way of recurring in the world, yet somehow we find it hard to believe in ones that crash down on our heads from the blue sky. And despite decades of uh, warnings from infectious disease, public health people that a pandemic was imminent, we still seem to be somewhat surprised in uh, early 2020 when uh, COVID-19 arrived. And also there have been as many plagues as wars in history, yet always plagues and wars take people equally by surprise. And of course in 2022, we've been doubly afflicted with a war and a plague. I want to draw attention to this independent panel report that was commissioned in the 2020 World Health Assembly. It reported out in 2021, not because it was particularly perceptive, the background documents are certainly well worth reading, but because of uh, two comments that were made. So, the world cannot afford to focus only on COVID-19. It must learn from this uh, crisis. It's been a terrible wake-up call, and now we need to wake up and commit to, uh, you know, better performance in the past. And uh, Helen Sirleaf, the uh, co-chair, said, the situation we find ourselves today could have been prevented. This was partly due to a failure to learn from the past. Now, I must say, as someone who's been involved in these uh, issues, so also a quotation from that report, a public health emergency of international concern is the loudest alarm that can be sounded by the WHO Director General. And I would submit we need a better alarm clock because we actually have to add monkeypox. So since the international health regulations were revised in 2005 after the first SARS, which I was involved with in, in Toronto, um, there's been, uh, can people hear the polio alarm ringing? Are you aware that it's out there? Uh, so we really need to think about things. Uh, and again, to distill, and it's already been mentioned, uh, after Ebola, I started to reflect upon my experiences and that there were structural similarities in each of the epidemics that I've worked on. And, it, you know, there was the same uh, language. It's a wake-up call. We have to learn lessons. You could see that after SARS-1, after H1N1, after Ebola. And finally, I said, you know, we really don't like to learn lessons. We keep falling asleep and uh, we either have collective amnesia or collective narcolepsy because we keep falling asleep and the alarm clock has been ringing and we keep forgetting these lessons. So this is not a, a WHO officially sanctioned publication, but our working group came up with a paper on what we thought were five key lessons that needed to be learned. Obviously, we need to learn from what we've learned in the past, and we need to actually somehow concretize that learning and take it into heart. We really need to work on prioritization of overarching goals. There was a lot of goalpost shifting. I could talk for a long time on this particular issue. We need better collaboration across expertise. We relied heavily on experts during the pandemic but fail to recognize that in modern educational institutions, expertise is very, very narrowly focused and often can't speak to other uh, disciplines. Uh, we need to learn uh, to protect the most vulnerable individuals and populations. I can't, uh, you know, again, I could go on about how we failed here. Every pandemic preparedness document talked about who the vulnerable populations were, and the vulnerable populations themselves said, it's your policies that make us vulnerable. Yet, if you look at the experience, uh, you know, particularly older adults in Canada, it was quite a, a criminal, actually. Uh, the highest rate of mortality were in long-term care uh, populations, and everybody knew that they were the most vulnerable. And finally, communication. And uh, there's a, a massive amount of work to do there, and there's a new group at the WHO on infodemics because communication can be miscommunication uh, in the modern world. So I'd like to distill this and organize it into what I call the pandemic playbook. So each of the one, uh, experiences that I've had uh, has these five defining elements. 
One is that typically, and this has been, you know, I've got a longer presentation that goes back to Thucydides, high early morbidity and mortality among healthcare providers and caregivers because, of course, they're closely exposed in infectious disease epidemics. And each one of these uh, five uh, structural issues has uh, ethical issues attendant to it. And if you take a look at the ethical issues, they don't fall neatly into the domain of any particular ethical theory or scope of ethical reflection. The first ones actually relate to uh, issues around clinical care and individual uh, ethics about uh, how much risk you wish to take in providing care. Uh, early on, I chaired the WHO Working Group on Healthcare Workers' Obligations in Pandemics. Second one is there's always uncertainty, lack of evidence, and this was particularly germane in SARS-2, which pushes uh, it into research ethics. There's a real force for uh, uh, you know, rapid generation of evidence and pandemic exceptionalism. We have to sort of uh, evacuate the normal standards of uh, human subjects' oversight. Um, thirdly, there's uh, often early on, you only have um, uh, non-medical uh, countermeasures, so public health measures, mandates, uh, quarantine, which brings us into the domain of public health ethics, how we justify uh, restrictions such as masks, vaccines, quarantines, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we face scarcity, uh, and then that brings us into the domain of research al allocation and priority setting. And then finally, we'll face structural inequity, both locally and globally, which brings us into public and global health ethics and concepts such as solidarity, equity, and reciprocity. I submit that these five are structurally apparent in everyone. We've known about this for a long time, and of course, each one of these has been uh, particularly germane uh, during uh, COVID. And of course, there was an abundance of literature for policymakers to draw from. Uh, the point is that they didn't look at it. I went to Geneva in February 2020 to assume the, the co-chair of the uh, COVID-19 ethics working group and thought, yeah, our house is in order. We've got a guidance for managing ethical issues and in, uh, infectious disease outbreaks. I point to that Nuffield Council uh, Bioethics on Research in uh, Global Health Emergencies, which came out on the 28th of January. So I said to Michael Parker, who was the chair of that, I said, boy, you guys couldn't have had better timing. And yet, a year into, or a year and a half into the pandemic, started to look and say, it doesn't seem that there's been much uptake on any of this guidance to my best in any of the policies. So I did a quick little study of uh, whether ethics guidance documents showed up in any of the WHO technical guidance, and the answer was no. The only place where ethics guidance showed up was in ethics guidance. So we've distilled our uh, thinking in a recently published uh, perspective the New England Journal of Medicine with uh, Zeke Emanuel and Max Smith. Uh, this came out at the end of October of 2022, so it's fairly recent. And I'm just going to highlight uh, points at which uh, values enter into pandemic decision making. And I won't go into this in too much detail because I note that one of the uh, uh, speakers is going to deal with this in, uh, in, in, in more detail. So there's four moments uh, really where values enter into pandemic decision making. Oft times uh, when they're explicitly in, in, in invoked, if you see, if you take a look at, uh, you know, comments made by leaders, uh, by the Director General of the uh, World Health Organization, they like to use words like equity, solidarity, invoke things like moral catastrophes. But they're also present when establishing policy objectives, uh, when navigating trade-offs, and particularly when navigating uncertainty. And that fourth point I really would like to highlight because it's where uh, uh, philosophy of science and ethics come together, particularly under the concept of what's called epistemic or inductive risk. We need to recognize that science itself is value constituted and often uh, the way in which values enter into scientific decision making isn't articulated and therefore we have uh, a lot of confusion particularly when people start to talk about what it means to follow the science. So I've been involved in uh, several studies where uh, we're uh, interviewing and studying science advisors to see how they think about uh, the role of values in their decision making. So, as I mentioned, equity, fairness, solidarity, trust, security, and transparency are all explicitly invoked by decision makers. And of course, values reflect judgments about what is important or worth uh, and what can form the basis of what we ought to do and underpin choices in pandemic response. For an ethics audience, this is all bread and butter. Um, because policy objectives reflect judgments about what is important or of worth, they are closely linked with values, even if that link isn't made explicit often. So science alone cannot tell us which objectives are important or of worth. We need to make uh, value judgments. And it sounds like Sweden has navigated that relatively well. 
when navigating, you know, so of course when you're invoking ethics, it's not like it's an algorithm. They're going to have objectives that come into conflict. And decision makers must determine how much weight to give certain values and assess whether the promotion of one or more values should be traded off against the promotion of other values. But our argument is those values are already fairly well established. We don't have to go looking somewhere uh, to find what they are. We have uh, actually a fairly robust uh, point of departure. And finally, as I mentioned, this notion about navigating uncertainty, about inductive risk. When there's a large amount of uncertainty, uh, decisions can be wrong. And who takes accountability for this? So in clinical medicine, this notion of inductive risk, you know, the notion that all tests aren't uh, infallible, that you have false positives, false negatives that need to be sorted out. In clinical medicine, that gets sorted out under the fiduciary responsibilities of the uh, physician to the patient. But we're unclear about how this gets sorted out in a public health context. Who does take responsibility when you've uh, made a, you've interpreted evidence in a certain way, uh, cast your lot in a certain direction, and you're in error? Who makes the who? How do you uh, deal with the consequences? And how much risk is to be accepted? And more importantly, which population faces the disproportionate impact of those mistakes? So, with our ethics, so. Despite complaints, uh, research ethics guidance is well established and has for the most part functioned well. But I think we really need to work much harder on integrating ethics throughout the policy uh, uh, um, process. As I mentioned, uh, these five key issues are apparent in virtually every epidemic I've worked on. But it's actually, there's very little coverage in, you know, in the future, what are we going to do? Are we going to take ethics seriously? There's always a sort of technical view. And I think the ethics community needs to learn from knowledge translation, knowledge mobilization, and implementation science. We need to be better and more agile communicators using and working uh, with health communicators and social media. But we really have a lot to do to uh, you know, prepare and train health professionals, not just in clinical disciplines, but in public health. Uh, the, it was a very difficult uh, few years, but we should have seen it coming, and we should have prepared our uh, students and our, our you know, current practitioners much better. And I'll argue that we need closer links between policymakers, science advisors, communications offices, and ethicists. And if we could find some way of bringing them together into discourse, instead of this, you know, we, keep a, we have a very siloed academic mentality, but what uh, COVID told us is that we need bridgers, we need synthetic minds that can speak the language of several disciplines so that we can, uh, you know, prudentially and as wisely manage the challenges as we can. So in conclusion, I think I'm going to, uh, I haven't touched as much on how we could build that ethics capacity, but it's all in that paper. Um, ethical issues are constitutive and unavoidable in public health emergencies, but they're very poorly integrated into response plans. It's almost like we deleted that part of our collective human memory when we were scrambling for solutions. And there is abundant research and guidance on all elements of that pandemic playbook. We do not have to start from scratch. There's been a lot of thinking. You know, we didn't have to reinvent epidemiology in order to respond to the, we didn't have to reinvent uh, clinical medicine to respond to the pandemic, but it seemed like we needed to reinvent ethics uh, to respond. Um, for the most part, ethical issues are not regarded as ethical issues as such. They're still seen to be that there's a technical way that we can avoid the value dimensions of this. And in a longer presentation, I could show how even in the scientific and technical response, there's a large number of value decisions that need to be made that are constitutive and unavoidable. Uh, but unfortunately, if you look at uh, courses in epidemiology, uh, I think I teach the only course in public health ethics at our School of Public Health. And I'm lucky if I get six or eight students uh, because it's just not seen as something that's relevant and important. And I'm hoping after COVID that that uh, uh, sentiment will be changed. And these challenges are eternal and recurrent. Uh, allocation and priority setting will always be with us, as will issues around equity and justice. And I hope that in the future we can do a much better job than we've done over the past three years. And for all of you who've been involved in pandemic response, uh, my hat's off to you. I know it's been a huge amount of personal sacrifice. Everybody has worked extremely hard. Uh, everybody is feeling, uh, I think, stretched beyond their usual capacity. And uh, my heartfelt thanks to you for all of your efforts. And thank you for the invitation to be here. Yes. Oh. <laughs>
Thank you, Ross, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, we will have time to uh, put questions to Ross and to the other panelists later. Um, but I would like to take the opportunity right now to put a question to you on one of your recommendations. And we talked a little bit about it um, earlier today as well. And you mentioned that it's so important to develop closer links mm. between the actors in the system. So um, I thought about it. Do you have some best practices from the Canadian context? And do you have some ad advices to us? Yeah, so, so um, a good example from Toronto would be, you know, in 2003 we had SARS and it was the first public health emergency. Like, we were scrambling very hard. And everybody was brought together very quickly. Six years later, in 2009, with H1N1, it was close enough that those connections were still there so that people knew how to work together. So um, then, of course, it all falls apart in the uh, uh, subsequent decade. So the real challenge is keeping those tables together in the unpredictable uh, intermissions between public health emergencies. But if you can see, uh, they're coming much more frequently. So what I would recommend is uh, standing committees, tabletop exercises, uh, forming structures that bring various bodies together, and in the interim, reorienting our educational programs away from this very siloed expertise into this sort of, you know, not everybody's going to want to do that, but we need some way of keeping bridges open uh, between different disciplines so that we can actually have a cadre of people who are reasonably agile across the very different types of expertise that are required. Those would be my thoughts. So it's important to avoid silos, yes. to have structures and yep. have clear mandates. And, and understand that this will happen again. Yeah. You know, we keep getting over it and saying, oh, thank goodness it's over with you, exactly. now we can forget about it. But quite clearly, if you just look at that skeletal diagram of public health emergencies of international concern, these happen frequently. These are not rare events anymore. And this doesn't even touch the local outbreaks that you have on a day-to-day -day basis with salmonella or, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's lots of these things happening all the time. Thank so, you, Ross. Thank you very much.